Welcome back to part two of this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Staff, CPSC staff will brief the commission on proposed amendments to our fireworks regulation. The CPSC staff members briefing us are Dr. Rodney Valor, chemist in the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, Dr. Aaron Orland, chemist and also division director in the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, Ms. Meredith Kelch, attorney in the Office of the General Counsel, and Mr. Howard Tarnoff, senior counsel in the Office of Compliance and Field Operations. At the conclusion of the briefing, we'll turn to questions from the commissioners. We'll now start with the staff briefing. Who's going to start? Mr. Valor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, today, Meredith and myself are happy to talk to you about the uh, proposed uh, amendments to fireworks regulations. Uh, I'll start off by giving a background on um, fireworks, and then I'm going to turn it over to Meredith for a while, and then I'll discuss injury and death data, and then I'm going to discuss relevant voluntary standards when it comes to fireworks, and as well as staff recommendations um, to revisions to the CFR, and then I'm going to talk about the effect of adding aluminum to energetic materials. Then we'll go into an economic analysis, and then we will conclude. So uh, in 1973 and 1974, the uh, CPSC took over fireworks regulations from the FDA. And it wasn't until 2006 that an ANPR was issued to conduct a fireworks rule review uh, or look into changing the fireworks regulations. And it was under the 2014 op plan that directed us towards a fireworks rule review. And from that was completed in December 2015. And from those findings, um, uh, we were directed to prepare an NPR briefing package. So now I will turn it over to Meredith. So I'm going to walk through the statutory requirements that apply to this rulemaking just to give everyone a framework within which to view the recommended changes. So there are two statutes that I'm going to walk through. The first is the Administrative Procedure Act and the second is the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. Rulemakings in general are subject to the Administrative <coughs> Procedure Act or APA. The APA generally requires an agency to provide notice and comment. Notice meaning provide interested parties with notice of what a requirement would be in advance of actually uh, creating a final rule and comment being the opportunity for interested parties to comment on the substance of those proposed requirements. The APA also provides for judicial review of rulemaking so that when an agency adopts a requirement, for example, a court is uh, to set aside any requirement that is, quote, arbitrary or capricious. Um, as the standard for judicial review in the APA provides. In other words, a requirement that's not based on or tied to supporting data or facts. Turning to the Federal Hazardous Substances Act, this is the statute under which CPSC has authority to regulate fireworks. Um, the FHSA allows the CPSC to classify a hazardous substance as a banned hazardous substance and provides additional rulemaking requirements uh, in addition to those provided in the APA. So the draft NPR includes three categories of requirements, and uh, they're laid out in this slide specifically. Clarifications to existing requirements, easing of existing requirements, and new hazardous substance bans, which constitute uh, bans under the FHSA as it defines that. The first two categories, the clarifications and easing of requirements, do not create hazardous substance bans, so they need only comply with the APA requirements. The last category, however, not only has to meet the APA requirements, but also additional rulemaking requirements under the FHSA. So under, next, under the FHSA, um, the Commission can create hazardous substance bans, can create specific requirements, and can create labeling requirements. Um, looking at hazardous substance bans specifically, there's uh, one general finding that's required as a precursor. Um, the text of that requirement is, is in the slide, but to summarize it, 
notwithstanding labeling required under the FHSA, the degree or nature of the hazard is such that the protection of the public health and safety can be adequately served only by keeping the substance out of interstate commerce. This is the first of four requirements necessary under the FHSA. Um, in addition to creating hazardous substance bans, as part of that authority, CPSC can also create performance or design requirements for products that are hazardous substances. And finally, the FHSA also provides for labeling requirements, but our draft NPR doesn't include any labeling requirements, so I won't walk through those at this point. In addition to the first finding I just walked through regarding the degree and nature of the hazard, there are three additional findings that the FHSA requires for the Commission to adopt a hazardous substance ban or a performance or design requirement. The next three si slides will summarize these additional findings. I'll also give examples of the types of information that staff considered in assessing these findings. And in addition, the draft NPR solicits comments so that we could garner further information that would be helpful in assessing those findings. So the first of these additional findings relates to voluntary standards. It deals with the adequacy and effectiveness of an existing voluntary standard to address the hazard that the regulation seeks to address. When there is a voluntary standard, CPSC must find one of two alternatives in order to proceed with the regulation. The first of the alternatives deals with the effectiveness of the voluntary standard at adequately reducing the risk of injury, and the second deals with the likelihood and extent to which regulated entities will comply with the voluntary standard. There are three voluntary standards that Rodney will cover in his presentation, uh, making this finding relevant. In evaluating whether a proposed requirement has adequate support to make this finding, uh, staff considered factors such as the percentage of compliance with the voluntary standard, the severity of potential injuries, injury rates, and the vulnerability of the population at risk. The second finding considers the relationship between the costs and benefits associated with the regulation. The Commission must consider whether the benefits of a regulation bear a reasonable relationship to its costs. Benefits may include things like reductions in severity and likelihood of injuries, and costs include things like increases to manufacturing costs, sales prices, and decreases to availability or usefulness of a product. And the third finding looks at the relative burdens and effectiveness of alternatives to the regulation. <clears throat> Finally, in addition to the substantive findings, the FHSA also requires that an NPR include specific content. First, the text of the proposed rule has to be in the NPR, including the latter three findings we just discussed. Secondly, any alternatives the Commission may adopt, uh, and this NPR includes some alternatives. And finally, a preliminary regulatory analysis discussing the costs and benefits of the regulation, whether monetary or otherwise, the impact of parties, reasonable alternatives, the costs and benefits of those alternatives, and why the Commission is not proposing them. I'll now turn it back over to Rodney. Thank you, Meredith. Um, to start with, I'm going to discuss some of the injury data that uh, staff has um, gathered during a special study period from June 19th to J July 19th, 2015. And this, those are bookends for right around where most fireworks accidents occur. And this first uh, slide that I'm going to discuss has 31 in-depth phone investigations done by staff. And as you can see here, uh, almost all of the injuries occurred due to either misuse or malfunction. Continuing on with this 2015 special study, these are the estimated injuries based on age group and type of device. Um, all estimated and they're rounded to a, the nearest hundred. You can see that most of the injuries occur in the age group between 25 and 44. And um, some of the mo more notable devices that cause the injuries are firecrackers, um, sparklers, and reloadables, uh, aerial tubes that we're, that I will discuss a little further here because reloadable aerial tubes have been the cause of the more catastrophic injuries, which brings me to uh, the reported fireworks-related deaths in 2015. 
In 2015, there were 11 non-occupational fireworks-related deaths reported to the CPSC, seven of which occurred from holding a tube mortar device in proximity to the device or to proximity to the body. Um, I believe it was five. It involved uh, a consumer holding a device on top of their head and igniting uh, the shell and it took off and then the uh, concussive action created uh, severe enough injuries to cause death. And then there was of those proximity to the body, there was also two where it was being held against the person's chest and it came back and induced cardiac arrest. There were two more deaths where uh, it was from overlooking a launch tube, so it can be assumed that the consumer believed that the device was a dud, failed to function, went back to check on it, looked over the tube, and unfortunately then that's when the shell took off and essentially decapitated the victim. There were also two more injuries call, uh, caused from the manufacturer of illegal fireworks, so basically they were making homemade explosives, which is under uh, ATF jurisdiction. When looking at revisions, we staff looked at three voluntary standards, the first of which was the American Pyrotechnics Association, AP 87-1, and that has been changed most recently in 2001, and DOT regulates transportation of fireworks and requires compliance with this standard. Uh, this membership to the American Pe Pyrotechnics Association includes uh, nearly 85% of injury, or industry, and it has requirements for both consumer and commercial fireworks. We also looked at the American Fireworks Standards Laboratory uh, Voluntary Standards, or AFSL. They are always ongoing with updating their standard, so staff has been attending regular meetings and it's always um, a point to look at ways to change the standard in the best interest of the consumer for safety. And it incorporates both CPSC and DOT regulations. Um, it represents an estimated 85 to 90 percent of all U.S. fireworks importers, and their testing shows 95 percent of the tested samples are compliant with their standard. Staff also considered the European standard. This is used by many countries worldwide, and it's based loosely on 87.1, uh, but the European standard considers many more devices that aren't here in the United States. So, uh, summary of all of our recommended revisions. So, this is where staff uh, came to the conclusion that on many cases we should be harmonizing with APA 87.1. And the first section, 1500.3, is a definition section that are currently missing in our regulation but uh, occur in the other voluntary standards. They're common terms used in the industry, so we believe those uh, should be included. 1500.17A3 uh, is probably the most contentious of the revisions. Um, this is the pretty much known as the audible effects section, and uh, CPSC has been asked by industry on several occasions to look into modifying this part of the regulation. So I will get into this in more detail later, but uh, staff believes that we should adopt a quantifiable method for identifying devices intended to improve, uh, intended to produce an audible effect. Uh, and going to uh, defining that as having the presence of metallic fuel in less than 100 mesh. Okay, and without, with, throughout the reg, we recommend that the audible effects portion 
be removed with the burst charge rem uh, requirement that if uh, um, metal fuel is present, metal fuel less than 100 mesh is present, then the device is limited to two grains or 130 milligrams. And 1517A14, currently we do not have any limits on things that are not intended to produce an audible effect. So in theory, right now devices are limit, limitless in their pyrotechnic composition weights. So staff uh, believes in harmonizing with AP871 once again and setting limits on the pyrotechnic composition in certain devices. Um, once again, we, uh, we recommend that we add definitions to relevant terms used by industry. And in the prohibited chemicals section, staff recommends adding uh, lead and lead compounds, which are currently in AP 8871, as well as the addition of hexachlorobenzene, which is HCB, which is found in the AF cell vol voluntary standard. Uh, they also rec we also recommend setting contamination limits of 0.25% for all the chem chemicals contained within the prohibited chemical section, uh, as AP871 also has. Um, and this is a good idea as well because as a scientist, zero is a very hard number to prove, and as instrumentation gets more sensitive, then it's going to become more costly for industry as that comes closer and closer to like a single atom. Um, uh, the only exception for the 0 0.25 for the prohibited chemicals would be the HCB, which would be set at 0.01%, which is consistent with the AF cell voluntary standard. Fifteen hundreds. Well, 1507.3 addresses fuses, and currently in the Consumer's Fireworks Testing Manual, we already test for side ignition, so we, we still care about ac accidental ignition, and we just want to clarify um, this and putting this into the CFR. So currently, we, our test method is tested out. We test out. We put a cigarette onto the side of a fuse, test it out till five seconds even though uh, three seconds is what we enforce. 1507.4, uh, we recommend, which is consistent with AP 87.1, uh, defining what a base is, as well as requiring that bases remain attached during normal usage and operation. This would uh, hopefully discourage consumers from holding devices that they shouldn't be and preventing things like tip over, which cause many injuries as well. Um, 1507.6, staff recommends adding the APA definitions of burnout and blowout. These are terms commonly used in industry. Burnout is essentially when a fireworks device just explodes on the ground. Blowout was when basically a flame shoots up out the side of it or the other way around, <laughs> I'm sorry. And uh, the 1507.13, uh, uh, staff recommends prohibiting devices from projecting fragments. So uh, we don't want like an aerial device to go off and it be raining shards of glass or rocks or hard pieces of plastic. So staff recommends adding that requirement as well. So back to the audible effect regulations. So on this slide, this is the current CPSC regulation compared to AP 87.1. And currently, uh, staff, when we are looking for devices intended to produce an audible effect, there is, it's a two-part test where it is uh, the audible effects portion where you're the, a trained staff member goes out in the field and listens for an audible effect. Okay. When the staff member does this, they are not listening for the, how loud the uh, device is, 
but rather they're listening for a distinct noise made, which is uh, relates to the presence of metallic fuels. If it is a black powder device, it's more of a muffled noise, whereas if it's a uh, if there's the presence of metallic fuel, it'll be more of a sharp, crisp sound, and that takes years to train staff to listen uh, for such a distinct sound. And then after that, that is the amount test. So after it's been determined that it has had an audible effect in the field, then uh, staff takes a device back and weighs it, and it, the device should have under 2 grains or 130 milligrams of pyrotechnic material. Staff recommends harmonizing with AP871, which would clearly just make this a laboratory only test and reduce some of the, or make it more objective. And with this, it would be just uh, looking for the presence of metallic fuel using uh, instrumentation like XRF or uh, ICP analysis, and if metallic fuel was found, then it would be limited to the 130 milligrams. Also, uh, current CPSC regulations, like I mentioned previously, don't have any limit for the amount of powder in devices if they did not uh, produce an audible effect, so uh, staff recommends putting limits on the total pyrotechnic material for all fireworks devices. Okay, so why is metal, why are metal fuels a concern? And that's why I have this slide up. Okay, so this slide is a graph taken from literature, and this is aluminum added to trinitrotoluene, or TNT. So TNT is the standard for which all explosives are compared, so that's why they use this, but you can imagine things like black powder behaving very similarly, okay? So first of all, the addition of metallic fuels increase the sensitivity of the device, so it would be more sensitive to heat, shock, friction, and you can see on this graph, <coughs> so this is explosive power versus aluminum content, percent aluminum. And so uh, staff believes that with greater explosive power, there's a greater injury potential. So more pow equals more ow, if you will. So uh, uh, at 0%, you can see uh, on the far side, there is it a known explosive power value. And then as you move along, you can see an ideal for having the most boom would be between 15 and right around between 15 and 20 percent is for the optimal explosive power that you can get out of an uh, energetic material. As you increase past 20 percent, the metallic fuel becomes ineffective. It starts to quench the reaction. So you have more fuel than oxidizer at that point. Now staff recommends that there be no metallic fuel. But as I mentioned previously, we understand that zero is a hard number to prove. So staff, staff recommends a compliance dis, uh, enforcement discretion of 1%, which is way far on the left side. At 1%, you only get roughly a 2% increase in the explosive power. But as you increase that by percentage by percentage, so at 2%, you're going to have 4% increase in energy. At 3.5%, you're going to get roughly 7% increase in it increases. Um, at 1%, also, it can be considered still at that amount a trace amount. Staff believes, and at that point, it can still be a contaminant. Anything more than 1%, staff believes that to start to be an ingredient into the mixture.
Okay, so staff in the long term, staff expects no significant burden expected with the proposed changes. Staff expects fireworks suppliers to comply with the new audible effects rule by substituting cheaper black powder for metallic or hybrid fuels. Hybrid fuels meaning um, mixtures of, with metallic uh, fuels added to black powder. So in conclusion, staff recommended changes harmonized with the provisions of voluntary standards AP 87.1 and AFCL most of which are already required by DOT regulations. Uh, CPSC testing of fireworks samples revealed that greater than 85% did not comply with the limit of pyrotechnic material when any metallic fuel less than 100 mesh was present. Most of staff's recommendations are clarifications of existing requirements and staff recommends publishing the NPR for comments on the proposed revisions and staff also recommends a 30-day effective date um, uh, seeking comments at, on that as well. And just at this time, I just want to thank the team members involved. I think Meredith, um, Robbie, Squibb from Econ, Jason Young from Compliance, Eric Hooker from Health Sciences to Toxicology, Matt Romer and Priscilla Verdino from LSC, and Youngling Tu from Epidemiology and as well as management for their support and guidance throughout this process. So at this time, and I'm sorry if I forgot anybody, uh, uh, yeah, I'm opening up for questions. Thank you, Mr. Valure, and I'm going to pick up where you left off, thanking the rest of the team as well, including management, a.k.a. Dr. Orland. And also I see back there Mr. Stadnick, who is our lab director. I know that the staff has put in really years into trying to find a way to evolve our standard. And this, it was captured earlier in your presentation, this was triggered in large part by Commissioner Robinson's amendment, I think it was maybe to the 2014 operating plan, asking for a full-blown rule review. And from that, of course, we have this package and we're very grateful for that. We are very eager, I'm sure, to explore different parts of the package. The area that I want to start with is, uh, really, which I think is the core of why we're here, recognizing that these are explosives, fireworks are inherently dangerous products. What are the safety benefits for consumers that you or really anyone else from the team see should the commission move forward and make these changes? Thank you, Chairman. The, the biggest piece of it, is, uh, as Rodney mentioned in his, uh, in his discussion, right now there are types of fireworks devices where there's no limit in the, in the CFR on how much uh, pyrotechnic material is allowed. And so by establishing limits, then we're hoping that we can eliminate some of the more dangerous devices and, and keep them a little bit under control. And also by eliminating uh, the metallic fuels that are very prevalent from our testing, uh, we can lower the, uh, the explosive power of some of the fireworks, still keeping them effective and fun, but eliminating the amount of uh, explosive power so that if they're accidentally or, uh, heaven forbid, intentionally used in close proximity to a person, then maybe we can limit the, the severity of the injuries and make them a little bit, uh, a little bit easier for the emergency rooms to deal with. And Dr. Orland, thank you for that. So focusing on that part, and at any point, if I'm mischaracterizing where staff is, please let me know. But I, I think I picked up from the briefing that, in essence, we are taking this from one of the voluntary standards that we would be, the staff is proposing that the commission adopt a, the relevant provision from the voluntary standard. Is that accurate? Yes. And that also, if I heard correctly, that voluntary standard is presumably very much complied with according to representations that we're talking about high levels of compliance supposedly with that standard. Is that correct? It, it depends on which portions of the standard you're talking about. There are portions of the of both the, the APA standard and the AFSL standards that are very well complied with. Uh, AFSL has a 
independent testing program, and so they have a method of validating that their product is complied is complying with the with the standard. Whereas the American Pyrotechnic Association and the Department of Transportation do not have uh, an independent testing uh, program or capability. All of all of those are self-certified that they comply. So of course the manufacturers say, if they want to get their their EX number for transportation, they say our product complies. Uh, our testing shows a little bit differently depending on the product type. The 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 biggest uh, hitter is these reloadable aerial tubes and some of the the mine shell devices, whether multi-tube. You know, aerial devices, most of those don't comply with that metallic fuel component of the of the standard. And are these made by manufacturers that are stating that they do comply? Or these are the carts that you see on July 2nd by the side of the road? The, uh, any, uh, any of them that are shipped within the United States and in interstate commerce have to comply with the DOT regulations. And in order for them to get their permit, they have to self-certify that they, that they comply with the regulations. So it's all of the above. Okay, so if I understand correctly, we're only, we would only be proposing that industry comply with something that they at least are saying that their own voluntary standard requires them to comply with and they're saying they comply with now. So from a market disruption standpoint, this should not, in theory, cause a lot of market disruption. Correct. In theory? In theory. Okay. As there, so you did an excellent job, Mr. Valor, of explaining how you came up with the one percent that threshold. Uh, do we have any sense? And it's fine if the answer is no. I'd just be curious to know where we go from there as to how to translate that that explosive power into risk of injury. Do we have any data on that or any theories about that? Well, um, I might have to talk to one of my. Uh, toxicology and epidemia, or I mean health sciences people, but the issue with that is there is no such thing as a safe explosion. So any explosion in proximity to the human body is not good. And then we're just trying to reduce that by lowering that explosive power. Do we have any sense that 1% is very different than 2% or 3% from the work that you've done? From the, I see the chart. Yeah, from the chart and from the fit. So as you go up, each percentage you go up, it doubles. So doubles the explosive power. So 1%, uh, 2%, and 2% is 4. And then like 3, 3.5, three it becomes this more exponential. It becomes like 8 or 9%. And mm -hmm. that's, we believe, is a significant amount of energy. Got it. And the last thing I want to ask at this point is, uh, and we just covered this, that it's covered, that we are in essence mirroring the current APA standard in large part, 87.1. Is that currently under revision? And if so, what might that mean? So the, the APA 87.1 is currently undergoing revision. They're actually taking, they're totally revamping the document. They're taking it from a single document that covers uh, consumer fireworks, commercial fireworks, and articles pyrotechnic, and putting it into three different standards, of basically A, B, and C. Uh, we, we have been involved with uh, APA in, in reviewing and providing comments on that document. It's currently, uh, I believe, on hold. I don't know what the exact status is, but I think they're waiting for us to do something. Uh, from our um, interaction with them and from what we've seen on the drafts, uh, it's, there, there's, not anything that's a real game changer that's going to, you know, if we come out with uh, what we proposed in the NPR, we're not going to contradict them or vice versa. Uh, the most of most of what they've done with changing the standard around, or at least on the drafts we've seen so far, have been more administrative in changing the way it's out laid out and and formatting, and, and then separating out the three different, very different types of fireworks into their own individual pieces in hopes that that helps make it easier on the permit process with the Department of Transportation. So, and, and they've, they've also been involved with, uh, with uh, Pipeline ha Hazardous Material Safety Agency, PHMSA, over at DOT in, uh, in reviewing that as well. So uh, the exact status of it right now is kind of unknown, and I think that uh, we're, both us and them are sitting around waiting to see what the other guy does, you know, in a little, little standoff. So hopefully we can uh, move things forward and provide a little bit better clarity. Great, and that helped alleviate my concerns that we might be moving in one direction and they might move in a different direction, but it sounds like that's not a concern. That's valid. Thank you very much, Commissioner Robinson.
I just really, really want to thank um, the entire team individually and, to, and together for the uh, excellent work that you've done on this. Um, this is really highly technical and complicated, or as we called it in my office, wonky. Um, <laughs> and it was, it's very much appreciated how much effort went into this. And as uh, Chairman Kaye mentioned, um, when I got, shortly after I got back from China with John Rogers sitting back there from AFSL, and one of the things that I did there is, is visit um, where they make, it's hard to call them factories, but where they make fireworks. And I know a lot of our staff has visited them as well. Um, when you combine that with what I've seen out at our laboratory in terms of of the kinds of dangers that we're trying to protect consumers from. It's a really, really challenging problem. And I knew that our, we all knew that our, our standards were out of date and it was really, really important that we get this right. So um, shortly after I got back, we, we um, introduced the, the amendment to the f uh, fiscal year 2015 operating plan asking for a thorough review of the fireworks regulations. Um, regarding whether the CPSC should maintain, revise, clarify, or update the regulations related to fireworks. And then at the end of 2015, a year later, you presented us with an outstanding comprehensive package that I really appreciate um, with your recommendations on how we could improve our regulations. And then obviously in our, in our 2016 fiscal year operating plan, we asked you to come up with this briefing package. And I also would just like to thank Commissioner Mohorovic and I work together very closely. Um, we've both been very focused on fireworks um, for some time. And we came up with in the interim a proposed interpretive rule for fireworks. I think based on my discussions with him before we uh, proposed this I I interpretive rule, um, to our fellow commissioners that we weren't expecting the large volume of comments that we got in, but my understanding is, and I hope it's correct, that those comments were helpful in terms of you coming up with this package that's before us today. So I also thank you for, for looking at those voluminous comments. So my, my question, um, I, I just want to follow up on what Chairman Kaye was talking about with respect to the APA. Um, the, the, the first thing is that um, I remember being out at the lab with the, with when some things were being examined um, that had the DOT, DOT self-certification. And I understand we've got some problems with this, which in terms of when we test the things that are self-certified, that a lot of them aren't compliant. Um, so I, do, do I understand correctly that it's even, this makes it even more important that we come up with something that's really enforceable um, on behalf of the CPSC? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> and I also, in talking to um, Dr. Borlase in our, in our weekly meetings, and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this because I think all of us are concerned with what APA is doing in terms of of their revamping their standard. Um, and um, Dr. Orland, you said that they, you, I don't remember your exact verb there, but you thought that they were on hold and were waiting for us. And I understand from Dr. Borlase that indeed they're on hold waiting for us. Is that your understanding of where we are on that? Y yes, it is. Okay. That was the good. last discussion we had with them was that they were waiting waiting for us. And, and DOT is, uh, is waiting until after the political climate settles out. Next, When's that going to be in Friday my life? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, so we should go ahead, as I understand it, without concern that they're going to do something while we're in our process. That's correct. Since we know that the political climate won't settle down. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the other concern that I have is that this is a very this is an unusual package in a lot of respects, but one of, the, one of the things that makes it really unusual is that there's almost five pages of items that we are requesting comments on. And indeed, I was reminded of the, the RFIs that we most recently did on crib bumpers in terms of listing a lot of areas that, that we need more information on. And in the RegFlex analysis, you noted that a number of the recommended requirements that would create new hazardous substances ban, that there's not sufficient information to make a finding to support a final rule on a number of items, specifically adding two chemicals to list of prohibited chemicals, adopting a test method to evaluate side ignition, 
and prohibiting devices from projecting fragments when functioning. Um, for the, my first question on this is for these items, do you anticipate that you're going to get enough information in response to this NPR that we're going to be able to formulate a final rule? Or do the analysis we need to do to formulate a final rule? We're looking back at econ, I know. <laughs> uh, thank you for your question, uh, Commissioner Robinson. Um, for the regulatory flexibility analysis, uh, as far as findings go, uh, it's only necessary for us to produce findings in the event we're recommending that the Commission certify the rule will not have a uh, substantial impact on a significant number of firms. And so we don't, in the uh, initial regulatory flexibility analysis, make such a recommendation. And so dependent on uh, the comments we receive, if we, see, if we receive uh, sufficient comments to make such a recommendation, then we would do so. If we do not, we'll proceed with a final regulatory flexibility analysis uh, in the same vein as in which we did the initial regulatory flexibility analysis. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and uh, the, other, the other concern I have, given that how much information we've asked for, is have you guys as a team sort of come up with a plan of what resources are going to be required um, for the next step? Because I just want to make sure you have enough because I think this rule is very important. Uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, the, probably a little bit more complex to provide exact details on, you know, how we're planning on shoring up some of the, the technical details of what we want to do because we're, we're still ongoing with, uh, with collecting data and looking at things. There's, there's uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of areas where we wish we knew more information and there's a hope that uh, maybe somebody in the industry will provide us with some of the data that we need. If not, then we'll go out and collect it ourselves, but it's probably a little bit out of scope of uh, the timetable we have here to, to talk in detail, but we can provide okay. that uh, as a follow-up. Just please let us know what resources are needed and, and I will do everything I can to make sure you have them. And thanks again so much. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the staff today for the presentation. Uh, as my colleague said, this is a highly technical case and I'm relying on your expertise. Uh, I do want to compliment my colleagues, uh, Commissioner Robinson and Mohorovic, for all the work they have done and the attention they've paid to the fireworks issue. And we have heard from uh, many uh, in the outside community regarding, and the one problem that you mentioned is this audible effect issue. So I look forward to learning more about the package um, and getting some of my questions answered now, but I'm sure we'll have additional questions as we go forward. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is the data. On page seven, you, no, I'm sorry, on page six, the fireworks injury data um, and the hazard patterns. So that's not traditional NICE data because it was just a very short period of time from June to July. So how, how do we go about gathering that data? And I don't, yeah, we need, probably need someone from EPI. Uh, it's a uh, in-depth investigation from the NICE data. So in each year we conduct special study around the July 4th because the uh, uh, average each year, like uh, two-thirds or three-quarters of the injuries, fireworks-related injuries occurred around that time period. So we conduct special study during that time period. We pick up the most uh, severe injuries like hospital admi uh, admissions and uh, eye injuries, uh, finger hand amputations, and then the head injuries. We assign those cases to telephone interviews. And then those 31 cases are the ones completed for 2015 special study period. Okay, so you're reviewing the NICE data on a daily basis as yes. it comes in and then you follow up with, if it's a fireworks related injury, you follow up with phone calls to yes. the hospital. Okay, okay, I wasn't clear about how that all works. Um, and then with regards to the, um, that same um, diagram, it, it, the other, what are the other injuries? It says there's 13 percent or four in number of cases but 13 percent of the injuries. It says uh, at the bottom, other 
and then debris. Uh, not this slide. It slides. It's oh, page the ones, six. Those four cases uh, from the uh, incident scenarios, we cannot pinpoint the problem. It's the victim just said they felt something flew into their eyes. Okay. So we cannot say that there's a misuse or mis malfunction. So we say it's like a okay. other categories. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and then on page seven, and again, and this may be an epi question, just I'm saying seven, but when I look up at the screen, that number is different. But it also has to do with the um, fireworks related deaths in 2015. Again, is the so sole source of this our NICE data, or do we have any other sources of this? Uh, we talk about uh, the. No, these are from the news articles and then from the field reports. So this is from like the, the clips that we subscribe to yes. when you say news articles? And what was the second source? Uh, the news articles and then sometimes, I think most of them from news articles. Okay. Thank you. Um, on the next page it talks about voluntary standards and it says APA membership includes nearly 85% of the industry. And then it says AFSL represents and made it 85 to 90 percent of the importers. Can you just clarify that for me? So the uh, AFSL is the, their, their, their number say, saying 85 to 90 percent, that's of the people importing stuff from mostly, mostly China. Okay. Uh, and because China is where most of the fireworks originate, they they publish their, you know, their membership based upon, you know, the ha percentage of the people who are importing from other countries. Okay, uh, whereas the APA, uh, they they report their membership based on fireworks retailers and sales and you know the the entire industry as a as a whole. So both of the two organizations represent overwhelming majority of the of the fireworks industry in the United States. Good, thank As, you. But AFSL also represent, you know, so, you know the, some of the importers where they're located in China sending stuff here as opposed to companies in the United States that are pooling fireworks from China. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how did staff decide what the pyrotechnic limit should be for the fireworks um, that are not intended to produce the audible effect? Um, we looked at AP 87.1 and those values are mentioned there. Okay, so that, that just mirrors that standard. Yep. Okay, all right. And has the staff revisited whether the two grains of pyrotechnic composition um, is the right amount or is that? That, that? That's another one where it becomes a question of what's the, the safe level for, for an explosion in close proximity to the human body and it becomes a very difficult question to answer, right? For, for me that number is zero. Uh, uh, on firecrackers, which result in a large number of uh, hand injuries, the limit on those currently is 50 milligrams, and, and we recognize that they create you know, a lot of uh, a lot of damage to the fingers if you hold them in your hand instead of instead of letting them go in time. So the two grain limit is applies to things that are not typically going to be held in your hands, and those are going to be used further away from the body. So we say that that's that's a that's a long historical one, but it's one that's really difficult to answer is whether or not that's Good, bad, or, or or anything else. It's a uh, it's kind of a difficult question to answer. Okay, uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all very much. Commissioner Mahorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to compliment all the staff who contributed to this effort, um, and especially our executive director. Uh, thank you for also uh, making staff available to me on several occasions, given all of the. Um, all the, uh, the work that you have in front of you, thank you for spending that time with me to help me better understand uh, what is an incredibly thoughtful, comprehensive proposal. Uh, it's obviously the recommendations. Uh, it's obvious to me the recommendations that you make are, are, are sound and in the public interest. Uh, I also want to uh, demonstrate my appreciation to my colleague, Commissioner Robinson, for her leadership in this area and also to compliment uh, the dedication, the time that she has spent personally uh, to get a better understanding of this industry, far beyond my understanding from going and, uh, and, and 
and seeing the way these products are manufactured and sharing those learnings with me and with the rest of the of the commission so uh, thank you for your dedication on uh, a, a smart product to uh, product category to spend time on fireworks as the chairman mentioned is one of one of if not the most uh, dangerous products we regulate uh, so I think all of this uh, work and, and the time uh, spent on it is perfectly appropriate uh, I do have some some questions for staff if you'll indulge me um, the first uh, set of questions I have relate to the proposed changes in uh, 1500.17 a3 so the audible effects test could you uh, and I appreciate all the uh, the work in the corresponding memorandum which is available to the public too which demonstrates uh, transparently some of the preliminary testing uh, that's been uh, done uh, to prepare this package. Could you provide, uh, because I do think it's important for the public to understand a general explanation of, of, the, of the audible effects test as it, as it stands today in terms of some of the preliminary testing you're d you've done as well as um, some of the results of your work with regards to uh, potential compliance rates, what you've seen with the uh, proposed suggestion in adopting the APA language. Don't make me pick one of you to answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So currently, as I mentioned in briefing, the uh, test that we currently conduct is a two-part test. Okay. So that is um, there's a field portion where we, where a staff member listens for a distinct sound, and if it has this sharp, sharp cra report, sharp yeah. report that I mentioned, then it is taken back. So that is um, the field portion, and then once, if it's determined that it did have an audible effect, if we do hear that sharp, crisp noise, then it is taken back to the lab, cut open, and uh, mass is made of pyrotechnic material, mm -hmm. and if it's at 130 milligram, if it's less than 130 milligrams, it would pass. If it's greater, then it would uh, fail. And um, what was the? Uh, excuse me. Well, what I'm really just generally looking for in terms of what the expectations are. So I understand the change is really going to clarify or change the method which, which, with which intended to produce an audible effect will be determined, moving from a technical staff expertise determination to the presence of metallics. Uh, if you could just generally relate for, for the commission and for the audience paying attention, what would we expect to see in, t in terms of the amount of product that would be rendered under the new proposal as intended to produce the audible effect? and then therefore subject to the two grain limit which you didn't mention but of course it's stated clearly the two grain limit will stay the same it's really just getting at what product is intended to produce that audible effect other changes aside so the 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 crux of the difference right, our, our current test is we go out in the field and we listen and then if it's determined that it's intended to result effect we come back to the laboratory we sieve out the the less than 100 mesh portion of it, weigh that, and if it's over 130 milligrams, then the, the device is uh, violative and then, or potentially violative, depending on how compliance decides. And then uh, if, if it's less than 130 milligrams, it's just fine. The, the, from the technical piece of the proposed test, what the laboratory would do is we wouldn't uh, rely on listening, which the fireworks industry has complained about for years that it's kind of a subjective test and they have difficulty repeating it. So the, the change would be that we would use the presence or absence of metallic fuel, which is currently banned by the voluntary standards. We would adopt uh, a very similar pr provision to what's already, uh, the industry already accepts as <coughs> intended to produce honorable effect, which is the presence of metallic fuels. If the metallic fuels are present, we would weigh it out, sieve it, weigh it out, and if it's over 130 milligrams, we still recommend uh, compliance that it's violative, and if not, then it's, uh, it's, it's okay. Understood. Thank you. Maybe from a compliance point of view, I don't think I'm doing a good job of answering my question. So, Mr. Tarnoff, if you could stay with me. And from some of the preliminary testing, not uh, statistically, uh, uh, you know, valid samples, uh, but just the from the preliminary work that we've done, 
from a compliance point of view in terms of our expectations and the impact that this may have on the market uh, on the market do we think that there will be fewer or less product rendered intended to be to produce a, an audible effect and therefore subject to the two grain limit under our under the proposed um, revision or uh, as it currently stands with the field testing I think it's hard to predict uh I think some of the products we currently find violative may not be violative, and other products that we pass may may not be passed. So we, we don't know. What we've done is a preliminary look at it, and I think on Rodney's last slide he showed that there are currently a high percent that have some presence of a metallic fuel. But I think we found that most of those are under 1 percent. In fact, most are under 0.4 percent. So we think the majority of products would comply, which is what they should do since they have a voluntary standard, which has been adopted by DOT as a mandatory standard. So we're not really asking for anything other than what is the current standard in the industry, and we would be allowing for the enforcement discretion up to 1%. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, a slightly different subject, but still staying with 15, uh, 1500-17A3. With regards to some of the tables that were referenced in the lab sciences memo, uh, specifically, I think it was Table 6 was provided um, showing some demonstration of some preliminary testing and the results as they were determined by uh, using XRF instrumentation versus uh, ICP. Was the purpose of, of providing that uh, one to ensure that XRF technology would be applicable and fit for use uh, as proposed under, our, uh, under the, the new proposed uh, changes? Yes, uh, table six, basically what we did was correlated our uh, XRF data with our ICP data. And um, if the XRF is under the right conditions, if you use it correctly, it would be a very viable screening process. And um, we think you could use XRF as opposed to a more expensive technique, ICP. It would be a very effective screening analysis. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think I have uh, time for just one more question. And this brings up uh, tables 7 and 8, with which uh, Ms. Kelch brought to my attention, and uh, I think it's important to relate. It has to do with some of the findings there, and, and maybe, Ms. Kelch, you can, uh, or, somebody, or one of the other uh, panelists might elaborate on the significance of that data, because if we do propose to move to the APA approach for determining an audible effect, and if in fact we move to a 1% contamination limit, then uh, that would require a significant amount of quality control and quality assurance with regards to potential contamination of uh, aluminum or magnesium. Uh, and that had always troubled me somewhat, uh, Commissioner Robinson, uh, based on, and I haven't seen, uh, I have not visited a fireworks fa uh, factory, but I think I know with confidence that they're, they're largely hand-made, hand-constructed products. And with that method of manufacturing, that introduces the potential for great variability and variation. So I, I, I was really troubled with whether or not, if we move to a 1% contamination level, whether or not that's even possible. Uh, under the current dynamic of how these products are produced. I mean, can somebody making a handmade firework uh, limit to 1% or less a contamination uh, limit? But maybe you can describe what you've uh, found in Tables 7 and 8 and how you have confidence that you believe the, st the industry can get there reasonably. So I, I shared in your 15 concerns. seconds. <laughs> I shared your Sorry. concerns about whether or not the industry could do this as well. There, there, we've heard uh, some... Uh, concern from the industry that this was possible. So we, we went in and we looked at, w one of the allegations was that uh, the visual effects, which also have uh, aluminum powder in them a lot of times, were contaminating the brake charges. And we wanted to go in to either prove that that was the case or disprove that that was the case. And we, we looked at it, it was very difficult because most of the, as we said, most of the brake charges that we looked at had aluminum present, so it was very difficult to find ones that the aluminum wasn't intentionally added. Uh, as a, as a short-term fill in the gap, we looked at the other uh, metallics that are in the visual effects. So strontium makes nice red colors, uh, barium makes nice green colors, and uh, copper makes nice blue colors. Is that right? Yep. Dyslexia mi makes me mi mix those up sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, we, we looked at the 
the effects that should not be in the brake charges because there's no reason for them to be there. They're, they're expensive. There's no reason they would add them. And we looked at them, and we, what we see is that when there's a, a couple of percent of strontium or copper or barium in the, in the effects, we see very small amounts, less than a percent, usually around a quarter to a half a percent of these uh, metals contaminating the brake charges. And we have confidence that with aluminum, when it's not intentionally added to the brake charge, it's also not going to contaminate the brake charges uh, from the effects as well. Excellent. Thank you. I thought that was a point well uh, worth making. I apologize for going over. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson? Nothing further. Commissioner Burkle? Nothing further. Commissioner Mohorovic, back to you. I do. I apologize. Uh, just on two other subjects. Uh, and first, it gets to 1507.3. Uh, is that the proposed, where the proposed change to the side ignition test resides? Uh, the side ignition test, it occurred to me that that doesn't reside in our regulation, but it resides in our test manual. So we have the, uh, so then is the test manual considered a de facto, <laughs> I guess I'm going to try to use everything but the word backdoor rulemaking. Uh, how we got a side ignition fuse test into a test manual, um, do we consider that a substantial, well, that, and that question can't be answered. I'm interested in, well, let me ask this. When did that get inserted, if you know, into the test manual, the side ignition uh, cigarette fuse test? It's, uh, it's been there for a very long time. The, the current regulation, I, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Meredith, but I, I believe it says something to the effect of uh, the fireworks must resist side fuse ignition. It doesn't describe how. how. It just the says method. they must resist. I see. And so the, the interpretation of that in the test manual has been three seconds, which is the in, industry, industry standard. Right. Uh, it's been in our test manual since the, the current revision, which is 2005, 2004. Okay. I forget off the top of my head, but uh, it's been there for, you know, a decade or so. Uh, it's, it's not, I don't think it's what you call backdoor rulemaking. It's, it's, we have to have a test method for determining what is resist side fuse ignition, and so it's, that's what's currently there, and that's what the industry standard is, is uh, a cigarette held on the side of the fuse for three seconds or, or longer. Right. But side fuse ignition resistance does not reside in our regulations. Is that correct? The regulation does provide the general provision that it, it has to resist side ignition, oh, but it does wonderful. not Thank spell you. out how to assess whether it resists side ignition. I appreciate so that's it. what lays in the Yeah, design. that's perfectly appropriate. Thank you. I, I didn't know that until this very moment, so thank you. Um, I do have some other questions. Uh, the last ones, uh, commissioners and panelists, um, to bear with. Uh, it has to do with 1507.2, the recommended changes uh, to add some elements to the prohibited chemicals. For those that are not familiar with hexachlorobenzene, um, can you provide a little bit more information in terms of, of uh, the potential risks associated with it and why staff is uh, recommending it be added to the prohibited chemicals list? Uh, hexachlorobenzene is a particularly toxic chemical. It's, uh, it's banned from global production in, in almost every country, including China. Uh, but it has traditionally been used in fireworks because the addition of chlorine helps makes the colors uh, brighter and, and flashier. It, uh, it makes the, the visual effects mm -hmm. more, more appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the uh, nature of its toxicity? How is it? In what, in what way is it toxic? I, I think we must have somebody from health sciences that might be able to contribute to a better understanding of the nature of its toxicity. Sorry, I have to refer to my own memo here. <laughs> um. Well, so several agencies have determined that it's a carcinogen. It has developmental toxicity, reproductive toxicity, um, toxicity to the liver, and had a cellular car carcinoma, so more cancer. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, and I notice also that staff is recommending uh, adding lead, and we're all very familiar <laughs> with, with lead and its toxicity. Uh, could, does, does staff have an opinion in terms of the, uh, what might be intermittent exposure to lead from fireworks? 
uh, and whether the, the, the fireworks uh, pose that hazard. Is there, is there uh, can you explain maybe the, the exposure scenario that we're concerned about, um, which is why we would consider adding uh, or prohibiting lead from, from being in the fireworks? Well, we have no information about exposure with fireworks to any compounds, but, you know, we just, we can hypothetically imagine it's dispersed in the air, settles on the ground, and uh, it can be inhalable, it can settle on surfaces hand for hand-to-mouth hand -mouth contact, yes. Exposure, understood, thank you. Um, now, was this uh, proposed regulation, I know that uh, what Commissioner Robinson had done to, uh, to jumpstart it again, did this begin with an ANPR? Um, uh, not exactly. There okay. was an ANPR issued in 2006, which explored a couple of issues. Um, one of the most broad being, you know, are there things we should add to our regulations? Right. Um, but it wasn't a regulatory review, and it didn't go through <coughs> specific areas in the way that this package does. Um, so to some extent, you could say that this is a follow-up on the ANPR, but not really. Some of the issues addressed in the ANPR have since been resolved, such as certifications. Okay. So, uh, w and then that matter was not resolved or withdrawn, so it remained on our agenda, our rulemaking agenda, the fireworks ANPR? Uh, I don't know that it stayed on the agenda. It's, um... It did. It did. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's on the regulatory agenda, if that's what you're asking. It is, and it has been Correct. even prior to the rule review yes. uh, action of the commission. Correct. Great. Uh, now, so, so we did have an ANPR, um, and uh, I recognize that the ANPR at that time in 2006 was, was somewhat wide open. Um, but I do recognize in Section 31 of the Consumer Product Safety Act that the Commission may not issue an ANPR for regulations under Section T 2Q1 of the Federal Hazardous Substances Act relating to a risk of cancer birth defects or gene mutations from a consumer product unless a chronic hazard advisory panel established under Section 28 has in accordance with Paragraph 2, et cetera, submitted a report to the Commission with respect to whether a substance, a substance contained in such product is a carcinogen, mutagen or uh, teratogen. I hope I pronounced that correctly, teratogen. So with the CPSC recommending adding HCB and lead as a prohibited chemical because of its concern as a carcinogen, we would be doing so without having had uh, assembled a panel, a CHAP. Uh, and does that create any problem? Or are there any designs to put a CHAP together so that I know the statute requires that we do that in advance of the ANPR, but we already had, that's why I was getting to procedurally where we are. You know, do we have an ANPR on the books already? So we do, so we're kind of picking that up from, do you see, nasty things happen when we leave these things out there for decades and decades. So we have an ANPR already out there, which perhaps I'm, I would imagine in 2006 didn't, didn't really envision um, the carcinogenetic effect or, or hazard, so therefore the, pa the chap wasn't, wasn't put together. Has anybody thought about CHAP as it relates to uh, Section 31 of CPSA as, as it relates to FHSA rulemaking? Uh, we can certainly look into that further. My initial reaction would be that this Section 31 that you're referencing falls within CPSA and our rulemaking would fall under the FHSA. Right. Um, but that's certainly something we can that's a examine good in more detail But it does you. say the Commission may not issue a rulemaking, Section 31 B1C in an ANPR rulemaking for, for regulations under Section TQ, 2Q1 of the FHSA. And this is Excuse FHSA Excuse me, Commissioner Mohorovic, I think we're venturing into some legal analysis that we should provide to you in another arena. Okay. Uh, is it is it the chairman of the commission's desire to, according to our DMPs, to go into executive session, or do we want to put this matter off? Uh, and I think it was clear that we haven't done full legal analysis yet, so I don't want so to be, um, be off the cuff, and I think we need to follow up with you. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. Commissioner Robinson, anything else? Commissioner Burkle, anything else? 
Commissioner Morovic, anything else? All righty. Having heard no further questions, this concludes the second part of the of this public meeting. Thank you again to the staff for all this work. We look forward to follow up discussions on it. Thank you for those who have attended or are watching online. This concludes this meeting.